I will go through the participant list from top to bottom and ask people to introduce themselves. And everyone can, uh, at least for the time being, has the ability to unmute themselves. So if Perry Freeman, if you say your name and your ward. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I thought we were only doing it for speakers. My name is Perry no. Freeman. Oh, sorry. I'm just here to um, attend the meeting. What Council. ward do you live in, Perry? I live in ward. <laughs> I live in ward two. I'm the city councilor for the central district, and I'm here to attend the NPA for the New York End. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming. Um, Franklin, your name and your ward. All right. Franklin Paulino, North District City Councilor, uh, Ward 7. And okay. Ali Matt. Jang is uh, going to join us soon. He was having some trouble logging no, in. No, you're just doing introductions now. Uh, okay. okay. Ali's here. Oh. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let me just get on the list. Matt Hurlbrook. If you could mention your name and your ward. Okay. Okay, I'm on it. He's Ward 7, and he is um, on the steering committee. Okay, uh, Carol Oda. Hi, I'm Carol Ody, Ward 4, and I'm a state legislator. Okay. Uh, Jeff Clark, you've already introduced yourself. Um, Nancy Comstock. Hi, I'm Nancy. I'm Nancy Comstock, Ward 7. Okay. Sal Millicamp and Bernie Carver. Hi, I'm Sal Millicamp, Ward 4. Bernie Thank Carver, you. Ward 4. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Carpenter. Eric Carpenter, uh, Ward 4 City Councilor and Ward 4. All right, Ali. Yep, Ali Jang, Ward 7. All right, and Devin, Devin Bates. He doesn't have his last name. No, Devin, yeah. oh, that, that's... Ali did. No, it says Ali's iPhone, but we'll, we'll, let's just go with the in introductions right now. Devin Bates. Which ward are you? He looks muted. I think he's, he's from muted. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he can unmute himself. He's from channel three, I think. Or no. Okay. He needs to put his last name. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I think he got off. off. Okay, Sharon Hart. Matt Robert, Ward 7, and the steering committee. Okay. Uh, Sharon Hart. Yeah, it's Shireen Hart. I'm Ward 7. I'm speaking later, and I will try my best to fix my lighting by then so you can actually see my face. All right. Thank you very much. And sorry for mispronouncing your name, Shireen. No um, problem. Uh, Elizabeth Goringer. Hi, Elizabeth Goringer. I'm uh, with the city of Bur Burlington. I'm a transportation planner with the Department of Public Works. I'll be speaking on the last item. All right. Thank you. Um, Emma Mulvaney Stenick. Hi, all. Um, I'm Emma Mulvaney Stanek. I'm a former city councilor from the Old North End, and I'm running for state representative in Chittenden 6 2, which is why I just want to introduce myself, which is the southern tier of the New North End. So thanks okay. for having me. I, I have a baby who I probably have to care uh, for in a couple minutes, so I just wanted to at least say hi. Thank you. All right. Um, just, this list is very dynamically changing all the time, so hopefully I'm not missing anyone. Uh, George Rutherford. George, what word are you? Okay, I'll go down. Okay, um, Jonathan George is Blaver. seven. Okay, thank you. Oh, did he just? I think, did he... Well, I think he went out. He's has to get back. I pulled him out because he didn't answer. Okay. Um, I see him still. He is word seven. Okay, he's word seven. Thank you. Um, Kathy Collier. I don't see her on. Oh, I do. Okay, if she doesn't, I put her in the weight room. Go ahead. Okay. Um, this is Monica Ivanich. Hi, I'm Monica Ivanich. I'm the Ward 7 School Commissioner. 
Okay. This guy just, I just tried to sparkle water and it's not terrible. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like not as gross as I feel like others are. Like I've taken like sips of. Okay, I temporarily had to mute everyone because there was something in the background. Um, let me just make sure that people can unmute themselves here. Okay, uh, let's see who else have we missed? Martha Friedman is Ward Four. Uh, okay, as far as I can tell, I've, is anyone who's not introduced themselves? Okay, Kendra. Kendra Sowers, Ward 4. I'm the North District School Commissioner. Okay. Uh, Martine Gulick. Hi, Martine Larock Gulick, uh, Ward 4 School Commissioner. All right. I know Keenan was waving, waving, waving his hand. Hi, I'm Keenan. I'm a uh, resident of Ward 7. All right. Uh, Judith V. Judith? Yeah, I'm, I'm Judy uh, from Ward 7, and I'm a resident. All right. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Jonathan Weber, or Weber? Yep, hey, Jonathan Weber, Ward 4, and also here representing local motion for one of the items later on. All right. Um, Leanne Schulman? Hi, uh, my name is Leanne Schulman. I'm a resident of Ward 7. All right, thank you. I think we've covered everyone. Who hasn't had a chance to introduce themselves? Oh, and Martha Mulpas, Ward 7, says that, she's, that she just simply doesn't have a microphone tonight. That's why she didn't introduce herself personally. So unless there's anyone else who hasn't introduced themselves, I'll return the floor back to Jeff Clark. So um, if everyone could use their video, we'll be using, um, you know, raising your hand to ask a question since we're all muted um, and we'll get started. We're going to start off with elected officials. And since I see all the school board here, I will start with the school board um, and get started with them. Who would like to go first. Okay, so that's who are, oh, who is on there's the school Bob board? Hogan. Monica. Martine and uh, Kendra. So Martine, I just unmuted. Kendra, you, I unmuted. Can you and hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, okay, those are the three. Thanks everybody, I think I will start. Um, I don't think my Wi-Fi is super robust, so I will keep my comments quite uh, brief. I First, I just wanted to thank uh, the community for uh, excellent, BHS graduation ceremony. Um, some of you may have seen that there were signs put up around the city. Uh, the Seahorse Pride group raised about $7,000 in donations to put up signs and to give our seniors a really special graduation and an unusual one. Uh, they hand delivered graduation gowns to students around the city and then they did three days of graduation ceremonies on the BHS campus where students drove uh, into the parking lot with their families and did a kind of procession up to a tent um, where they were um, basically recognized and then were allowed to ring the, the BHS bell out front. So it took three days to do that. It took a lot of effort and it, the community really pulled together to make it special. There was also a uh, parade um, and that occurred, I believe for almost all of the, the graduating classes. So fifth grade and eighth grade as well. So thank you to everybody um, 
there was, again, money raised and, and folks came out and made it very special. So thank you. I also just wanted to point folks in the direction of uh, reopening guidelines for the fall. If anybody is interested, you can go on the Agency of Education website. And what you would be looking for is a document that was posted on June 17th called Safety and Health Guidelines or guidance, sorry, for reopening schools fall 2020. Um, that really lays out what the plan is for reopening. Um, again, uh, as you probably all know, this is a, uh, a dynamic situation that could change, but it is interesting to see what the plans are for reopening in the fall. And um, it's, a it's a good document, it's readable, and it, it highlights all the important points. Thank you. Hi, this is Kendra, I can go next. Um, I wanna to welcome Tom Flanagan to our district. He starts on July 1st. He's already been hard at work meeting with um, district leaders and um, school board members and uh, principals and Vermont Agency of Education. So he's gonna hit the ground running, which is great. And it's also pretty awesome because he is going to be moving to the new North End. So he bought a house in Apple Tree. So that's exciting for our our wards over here. Um, so I also want to talk about summer meals. We're having them provided at no charge. We have breakfast and lunch at a variety of, of places over um, throughout the district. And in the north end, our sites are at North Avenue Alliance Church from 9 to 10 in, 9 to 10 in the morning and also at Northgate on Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 9.30 to 10.30. And we added a supper um, in the park at Roosevelt Park um, from five to six for this summer. So that's pretty cool. Um, and also we are having summer school that is happening and it's a hybrid. Some is in person and some is remote. It's from everything from pre-K through K to five, middle school, um, special ed. We have some EL and um, some community partners are working with us to keep up the middle school for students. So, um, and we wanted to say um, a hearty goodbye to our last superintendent, of course, um, Superintendent Obang, who basically his last, last day will be at the end of June, although he's taking some much needed vacation time to get transitioned into his, his next job. That's all I have. Thanks, Kendra. Mm -hmm. And Monica Ivancic here, Ward 7 School Commissioner. Um, just wanted to say uh, there was a going away party for uh, Superintendent Obang last Friday at the high school uh, where some commissioners came to say goodbye and district leaders as well. Um, and to add to uh, Kendra uh, mentioned Tom Flanagan, he's moving into the new North End and he has three children. One will be attending Hunt and two will be attending Lynn, I guess, depending on where apple tree goes. Um, and most of you know that I am part of the diversity, I'm co-chair of the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee of the school board. And I've been in that role for over two years now. And across the country, there's been a big effort uh, with the killing of George Floyd um, to defund the police and to uh, get SROs, uh, which stands for Safety Resource Officers, um, out of our schools. So, um, so a lot of our community is interesting, interested in uh, removing police officer president, presence in our schools. Um, in our um, city, we have two SROs, two active SROs, Mike Hemond, who staffs the Burlington High School, and Jessica Norris, who staffs both the middle schools. Um, these officers also um, look over several other uh, school buildings and in the ele elementary schools, um, they participate in the, in the drills, uh, the run, hide, fight, um, and other safety drills. Um, and so with recent events, as you know, in the city council, lot, lot, lots of listening sessions, uh, we dedicated our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee meeting last night to the topic of SRO presence in our schools. 
um, the city has had, uh, sorry, the school district has had a memorandum of understanding with the Bur Burlington police since 2015 uh, that was signed by, it's an agreement between the superintendent, so Yao Bang, and the chief of police, Brandon Del Pozo, back then. And so in the last five years, we've been following this memorandum of understanding and police are not supposed to use punitive punishment. They're not supposed to touch children. So there's, and they're also part of the restorative practices efforts in our district. Um, so it's worked really well, but the presence of armed police um, at schools is very traumatic uh, for for many people, for uh, especially uh, our students of color. And um, last night, at last night's meeting, uh, we had 57 participants. Um, I you've got one more minute, and then you need to wind up because we have the other officials. Okay. Um, yep. And uh, so uh, we had 15 speakers, uh, four of which were former students. Uh, and all these speakers spoke against having SROs in our schools. Um, and then we had somewhat of a discussion. So the board has not formed a stance on this. We have another board meeting tomorrow evening starting at 6 p.m. And if you would like to come and give your um, public uh, comment, we'd really welcome, we want to hear from the community how you feel um, and you know everyone's concerned about safety but we also don't want to traumatize our students. We would like to have best results for students. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Next, we'll go to the city councilors. Okay. Nick, when do you want to go first? Let me, uh, I will unmute. Franklin's yeah, unmuted. Well. All right, hi. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Yep. All right. So uh, since our last meeting, um, we've had a lot of meetings more than you uh, more than usual um, in large part, um, as I'm sure you've heard, there's been a, I would say there's been two things that have been occupying our, um, our time. Uh, the main thing being the budget this year, uh, unlike I would say most years historically is a contested issue. Um, where uh, the budget is being used to, uh, I guess, make amendments to it. So, which is amendments that are not, uh, I guess, routine, I would say. Um, so we've had, as, as I'm sure many of you have heard, a lot of public forum, uh, I think it was like over 14 hours um, about the police department budget. Um, I would say that you know, in reviewing the last month's meetings, um, the other thing that's important to be aware of that I've received, I think I'm sure Councillor Carpenter and Councillor Jang will, will also say that we've received a lot of um, communication. So I, even though we haven't taken action, it's worth uh, discussing as um, is Councillor Freeman, I understand she's at, at the meeting, uh, the Just Economy Ordinance um, and you know, if you don't know about it, it basically um, is a resolution looking to uh, explore and send to committee uh, essentially uh, a question for the voters that would, um, voters would vote on different things. And um, I think many of you, you received a lot of input from, you know, people concerned about the tax for people making over 125,000 as well as se selling of homes over 500,000. Um, and I think that, that People should be aware of that since we have received a lot of uh, feedback um, on it, even though we haven't taken action on it. So it will be at the next meeting, I think. I'm not sure it's going to be the budgetary meeting or the following, but we haven't voted on it up or down yet. Um, you know, as to the police commission budget, I would say that it's an open question as to what's going to happen. It's really you know, there's a large group of people calling for 30% cuts. Um, you know, I'm not in favor, and I think I've been pretty clear, I'm not in favor of any kind of dramatic 30% cut right now, unless people can show me that somehow it would increase public safety. Um, I do think some modest cuts would be, um, 
And so I think that's what we're, in my opinion, gonna end up focusing on is whether the mayor's already cut it, I think 1.1 million dollars. And you know, some of us wanna see it cut a little bit more. Um, and, and to be clear, the people that wanna cut it, even the people that wanna cut it 30%, they wanna redirect the resources to other programs that they feel um, might address the needs of the community. So it's not particularly like we're saying, uh, we're gonna take the money and put it somewhere else. Uh, we'd like to keep it in public safety. Okay, thank you. Uh, who's next? Ollie? Uh, Sarah Carpenter. Hey. Hi. Um, well, as Franklin pointed out, we have been spending really the last three weeks huge amount of time trying to get uh, public input on the budget process. So that has, that has occupied all of our time. Um, and I, for those of you who are on here, if I haven't gotten back to you, it's because we've been inundated with hundreds and hundreds of calls and emails. So we're listening, I'm listening, and we're hearing, and we're gonna have to wrestle it out in the next, next week or so. The plan is to try to make some decisions on Monday night, the 29th, or that may carry over to Wednesday the 30th. Um, other issues that um, I've been working on, I'm on the Community Development Committee, and we've been looking at a couple of issues around tenant protections. Uh, one of them is um, just cause eviction or no cause eviction, and we're just beginning that. We've really not done any of the work on that. Um, we hope to start you know, digging into that in July. We've also been talking about the role of the Housing Board of Review and uh, what they do around um, supporting tenant on security deposit returns and um, code enforcement appeals and is there a greater role there. And through those conversations we've identified, I think, some significant gaps in the system around education for both landlords and tenants, which is a, sort of a nut we've got, we've got to crack. Um, so that'll be working on that. Some of you um, also more specifically who live in my neck of the woods um, may be aware there's been a conversation about some of the stormwater runoff that um, is near the Legal Bay in Lakewood and there's actually a meeting tomorrow night at 5.30. It's been out there on Front Porch Forum with the Water Resources Department to specifically talk about that. Um, and this is part of their integrated water quality planning. And for those of you who haven't, I encourage you to go on their website and listen to their little webinar about what they're beginning to do. This is a result of a fairly massive amount of planning um, to try to clean up the lake. And um, it's going to take multiple efforts, in, including the, all the work on the sewer plant that we voted for. So that's really a good thing, but there's a lot of initiatives that will start affecting us and they're going to be seeking input on and it, particularly as it relates to private property owner um, activities and responsibility and things that private property owners might be able to do to help water quality. Hey, thank you. Ali. Okay, I just asked Ali to unmute. But if he has to do something on his phone to unmute himself. He's he's having some trouble hearing, I think. You may have to why don't we go on? Ellie, to... you're muted. If you could unmute, hit your square. Okay. There you go. Oh, there he is. Okay. Okay, you're on. No, you're muted again. Ellie, could you hit your square and unmute? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. All right. Yep. Uh, I am very sorry, but I cannot hear anybody for some reason. Is it my time to speak? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so I don't know exactly what uh, Franklin and Sarah has talked about, but I just wanted to provide some updates around what's going on in the city currently. And it is all about the budget. It is all about the demands that we have received from Rachel Justice Alliance and trying to work hard in making sure that we pass the budget by next Monday. Um, and um, just want to take the time to thank all the new North Enders that took the time to show up and have their voices heard. And um, this is an announcement that actually tomorrow at 6.30, we have scheduled another Zoom meeting with constituents in the new North End to specifically talk about the demands, as well as um, the budget uh, and, and defending the police and all of that. And it's tomorrow at 6.30. Uh, we hope that you all will be uh, able to join us. But so far we have 14 people that are available um, that talk to us that they will be able to um, attend. Right, so I think I'll just leave it to that for the sake of time. Thank you so much. And thank you, Franklin, for sending me the, uh, the link. It's still not working for some reason. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the legislators. Um, Carol, I see you at the top. Would you like to go first? Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, Gina Sullivan has been trying to get on since the beginning. I sent her two links and she can't get on. If anyone can help. Okay, so since the start of the pandemic and the, um, uh, and the emergency orders, um, people have sacrificed to save lives. Businesses have sacrificed to save lives. Essential workers have sacrificed to save lives. And now we are trying to help them. Um, we have been given more than a billion dollars by the um, by the federal government to do that with Corona Relief Funds. And in the past three weeks, we have figured out how to spend about a billion dollars. We've never done anything like this ever before. Um, the House is now sending that package over to the Senate to see what they think. The, um, today we passed the first quarter budget and the Pay Act. But most importantly, I wanted to talk today about um, this morning, I was at the Social Equity Caucus, of which I've been a member since it started. And um, there today with us uh, was Congressman Peter Welch. And um, he spoke eloquently about racism. And I wanted to share some of what he said. Um, racism is embedded in our culture. It is a lack of awareness that racism is systemic. It's not something everyone learned about in school. And because it can be a goal in our lives to be lifelong learners, we have the opportunity every day to learn and grow. Our nation has seen in Minnesota, George Floyd, for whom eight minutes and 40, 46 seconds pleaded for his life, called out to his mother and called out that he could not breathe. At the same time period in New York City, a white woman whose dog was illegally unleashed in a park who threatened a black gentleman who was bird watching, saying she'd call 911 and tell the police he was threatening her. And at the same uh, time in Georgia, a young black jogger was st who stopped to take a look at a construction site was shot by a father and son. All of this is, a, is just an example of the systemic racism in our country. And all of this taking place at the same time as the global pandemic where so many black and brown Americans are on the front lines providing essential services in healthcare, food processing, cleaning, nursing, doctoring, and they are in, disproportionately impacted adversely by COVID-19. Now is the time as we learn and grow together to make the deep systemic change that's needed so we can as a nation achieve what our constitution promises that equal opportunity for all and that all are created equal. Regarding legislation in this area, I believe we can't have only the legislature making all the decisions. We need to take the time to engage and listen around the state and the process will be very important uh, to get to the outcome we need. Regarding the policing presentation that's on uh, tonight's agenda, I don't know exactly what they'll be saying, but I know that I've been doing research and that I have found that there's a 21st century policing report. It's based on data. It's created by the executive order of President Barack Obama in 2014, and it is an excellent place to start. It's a place that probably the school board is looking to figure out how to deal with school resource officers. Um, basically, it one divides. Minute, okay, one, one minute. You're almost, you gotta wind up, okay? All right. 
It's three levels, local level, law enforcement and communities. Cre big in the local level is creating listening opportunities, um, funding the changes that are wanted, conduct conducting community surveys regarding policing and publishing the results, defining civilian oversight of policing and recognizing and, and addressing the root causes of crime. And there's more, there's a beautiful summary in the very beginning of this report. You can just Google it and it, it'll come right up. And I know that I will use it um, to inform the work that I and the, the legislature will be doing as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, we'll go to Bob. Bob, could you unmute? There you go. You got me? Welcome. Wow, thank you. Um, so a lot of the stuff that Carol talked about, we're both involved in. We were both at the meeting this morning with Peter. Um, good thing. Um, we have literally sent millions and millions of dollars out to local businesses. Um, and a lot of it is going to be eligible to come here. So I think we'll see uh, that as a positive thing. That's the federal money that has come down. Um, Personally, and I'll go through, I've been on this thing since eight o'clock this morning, so I'm a little fried about it. Um, I'm still working a lot with unemployment cases that are still coming in, people that uh, are not able to get through to the system or get their benefits. Officially, our work as legislators ended a couple of weeks ago, but um, word gets around, I guess. Uh, the committee that I'm on, Government Operations, is uh, working on the legislation that's dealing with policing and social equity and that whole global perspective of things. Oddly enough, a lot of the individuals that are coming forward uh, are asking us to slow it down a little bit so that we get it right as opposed to get it done, uh, which I think is a good thing because it's a very complicated sort of issue and unintended consequences. Uh, take for instance, the defunding the police thing uh, if you end up defunding social workers or you knock people out that uh, accompany SRS workers or mental health workers um, doing their job in the evenings, that's something you probably want to try not to do. Um, I'm also involved with a couple of other members from GovOps and a couple of people from the community on trying to get several of the bills together that deal with the injustice, the reparations, the whole gambit of those things into one concise bill that we might look at uh, in August. Uh, it's kind of an independent effort thing. Uh, Coach and Hal and myself and a couple of people from other committees, Brian. Um, today we did election stuff, pay act. Um, I know there's a lot of charter change conversation here in town. That'll come through our committee. So feel free to reach out to me if you're on a city council and you want to give me a heads up about what might come down the pike. I'm all talked out. Thank you very much. Okay. Gino Sullivan just got on. So, um, you're up Gene. Thank you. Thank you. I, it, I'm sorry. It took me a while to get on. So, um, I'm vice chair of house commerce. A, a lot of the money committee money went to my committee. The last bill I'm really proud of. We've got some things in there that, should they survive the Senate, and I believe they will, will be very exciting. My favorite was, um, my chair and I started talking about when we're when we're when we're sending out money to businesses, who who's really getting that money? We knew with the Payroll Protection Act, the bigger companies got the money first. So what we did is we created a $5 billion minority and women business owners grant fund. It'll be um, handled through both uh, Curtis Reed's operation down in Brattleboro, which does outreach to minority businesses and the Vermont Commission on Women will do outreach for women. And the goal is, is those two, the minority owned businesses and the women owned businesses tend to not necessarily have as many close relations with banks they might not have access to a lot of the good programs that are coming out. And we're, we got that so that we made sure the two and a half million dollars goes to each one of those groups over and above everything else. The other thing we did for $5 million, another five, we keep throwing this money around, 
was, um, and this was just pure luck. My daughter was on the phone with Dave Zuckerman because she's volunteering on his campaign. And they were talking about a really wonderful program that Skinny Pancake does called Shift Meals, where they buy produce from local farmers. They then ha pay their workers to make dinners up that then go to the food shelf. And it was wonderful. And they're trying to go, and they were, and there was a group trying to go statewide. They were talking to the wrong people. They were trying to get FEMA money. FEMA money has to bet. You got to spend the money and then you bill FEMA. So I said, so I, we put in $5 million for them in my bill so that um, we have an opportunity that they can spend that $5 million bill FEMA again. And now we've got a rotating $5 million fund. This will bring small restaurants all around the state who, get, who can put out these meals approximately anywhere between $9,000 to $11,000 a month additional income for them and will be buying pro farm products from farmers. So that's really good. Um, the rest of the program and the bill that came through my committee was focused on small business as best as we could because the first bill, we, we literally threw money at it. While people are listening, I've been posting on Front Porch Forum, if you are a small business, if you have rooms and meals tax or you have sales and use tax in your business, make sure your MyVT tax account is up and operating on the state tax website. They have five, they've got $50 million that they're gonna put, be putting out in grants and they're gonna identify who should apply for those grants based upon the drop in your rooms and meals tax or your drop in sales and use. So keep your eye out and make sure you've got that link ready to go so we can really facilitate you getting money. I, like Bob and Carol, are still working on unemployment uh, it's tough, and today we are working. It, I, we are trying to get a special COVID-19 workers' comp coverage set in place until January 25th. It's going to be a tough fight. Uh, it's to make sure that if you are, say, you're, a, if you get, COVID you need to wind up. Okay, if you get COVID-19 in your place of business. The only way your work, your employer can get at, can get out of paying is to prove that they are following to the T what the what the Commerce Department has dictated for a safe opening. It's been a busy week, and thank you. Thank you. We'll start off with questions, and um, I see that um, Keenan has a question. Um, Perry and Jeff Comstock. Um, so we'll start off with Keenan. Hey, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to put on, uh, so there's been a lot of talk about um, police uses of force and sort of like different, I know that a lot of our uh, local reps and um, state reps are looking into this issue. Just wanted to put on your radar this book, Evaluating Police Use of Force, it came out literally uh, the second week in May. Um, I provided, um, I've read it, it's great, I provided a little insight to some of our local officials, but if you're interested in doing some work on this, I this provides like a nice primer to um, sort of use of force law, both at the constitutional it's, level. It's and supposed to be a question time, Keenan. At the administrative level. So my question is, will you look at this book? Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Jeff Comstock? Uh, see if he needs to unmute. Uh, I, need to, I need to unmute him. You shouldn't uh, be muted. I see Nancy. Oh, Jeff is right. Okay, All he's right. unmuted now. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yep. I have uh, I have two, uh, a comment and a question. question. So the, the comment is to um, make folks aware that I communicated with Kendra earlier this evening because I was trying to do the um, MOU survey online and I was having difficulty accessing uh, the survey. So I don't know if, and so if it supposedly closes tomorrow, that sort of limits available time. I don't know if others have had uh, similar difficulty. And my question is actually for our city council folks. And I wanna raise, uh, I, I wanna ask you your perspective on the distinction between advocacy and public opinion. Um, 
both in terms of the uh, just economy charter change ordinance and the discussion around uh, the police policing funding and the budget. So um, I'm particularly concerned about the uh, charter change for the just economy because in my reading, um, the schedule in, in this charter proposed charter change is a very cynical approach at manipulating voter turnout for specific elections to uh, in an attempt to pass specific charter change elements. So, um, so for all the city council folks, I would like to follow up on that conversation with you. And I am very concerned about the proposed schedule in that charter change. And um, as far as the police- What's your question? I was asking them for their perspective on the distinction okay. between advocacy and public opinion. And particularly uh, concerning because in Ali's email, he um, is very happy that the city council received public opinion from thousands of people from the city and surrounding communities. And I'm, uh, I have a real problem with folks from the surrounding community uh, manipulating the discussion about our upcoming budget proposal. Thank you. Did any councilors want to react now, or do you want to pick this up with Jeff? Um, we have a couple minutes before our next presenter starts. Yes, uh, if I may, yes. Um, thank you, Jeff, for the question. And I don't remember sending an email saying that I'm happy about the uh, surrounding community, but sending it to you directly, but I'm pretty sure those are my words. And up, up, of course, I think I'm very happy um, to be in a at the city council and also to receive for the first time since 2017, thousand people showing up and speaking in Brussels. I think they've been advocating and also they've been providing their perception about the issue itself. Now, as city council, this is what we want. This is how business should be done. When people show up and express their concerns or also tell us just what they, what they think. I appreciate that. But I don't know if that aspect will also um, change much about my perception about this issue. Now, for a couple of things about the police, there are things we cannot talk about, at least not publicly right now. And it is specific to the firing of the three officers. And at our last meeting, I requested to go public forum, I mean, to go executive session in order for us to talk about it in depth, because it's part of the demands from Rachel Justice Alliance. Um, but me, I mean, my style is I wanna listen. And I think we listened for over 25 hours and now that it is about time to make a decision. Now, all those people that we listened to, I can tell you maybe seven maximum are people from Ward 7. Reason why we are establishing another public forum just for the people in the new North End tomorrow. Um, and um, that's where I will leave it as of right now. But thank you for the great question. Franklin and Sarah, any um, reaction or answers? Well, I, I do appreciate listening to everybody. It's, it is really important. Um, I think the city of Burlington is a key city and we need to understand what all our residents want as well as the people that come and use the services. And we needed to take the time to listen to it. And then I think, as Ali said, we, we have listened and now we've got to make some difficult decisions. I think the, the core of what needs to happen um, is really, really important for us to look deep within and figure out how we can make some changes. And some of them are gonna be difficult, very difficult changes. And so um, I, I did not mind spending the time listening to people and we've done that. And now we'll have to sort out how we're gonna take it the next, the next steps. Hey, uh, it's time to move on, I think, Jeff. Terry, was your question quick? Can you oh, unmute her, Eric? Uh, just a moment, let me. Okay. 
Sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand, so I apologize for that. I, okay. I didn't have a comment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Eric Farrell, we're going to, um, can you unmute Eric Farrell now? Eric, Eric um, is a project manager and principal developer of Cambrian Rise here to give us an update. Thank you for attending and um, giving an update. Welcome, Eric. Can you um, hit your, you're unmuted, great. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. you we can see you. Can you hear me? Okay, oh my God, maybe I should turn the lights out. <laughs> no. So Jessica, uh, Jessica it was, uh, LaFall was gonna join because she has some uh, images to show you. Jess, are you? She's here as well. So well Eric, can you unmute Jessica LaFowle? She's, She's unmuted, unmuted now. Welcome, okay. Jessica. Thank you. So, uh, you well, other... do I have permission for screen sharing? Yep. Okay. Yes. But you're, you're, we don't have a video. Your camera's not on. There, whoops. <laughs> so you want me to, so I, I, while she's working that out, you want me to tell you what's going on? Sure. Sure. Okay. So most of you or all of you know, we opened Liberty House, the old orphanage, uh, three years ago, 2017, 65 units. Um, we uh, purchased the old classroom building uh, uh, in uh, early 2019 started renovating that building built a big addition on it that building just opened that's not, that's the uh, on north avenue attached to the orphanage on the south side attached to liberty house i gotta stop calling it the orphanage um there's 90 units in that building and 20,000 approximately square feet of commercial space on the first floor and we actually moved our office into that building uh, last week. That was daunting after 14 years. Eric, can you hear us? Your screen went Colchester. Dark. I'm back in Burlington finally. Now I live and work in the community. Excuse me? Your screen went blank and we, you did check out a bit. Um, we couldn't You're hear cutting you. Out. Say that again? You're you cutting out a bit. Yeah, well, I check out more and more at my age, but so <laughs> no, it's uh, no Cathedral excuse, Square. Eric. Is, yeah, so, yeah, well, I'm gonna <laughs> use it. So Cathedral Square is under construction there for seat 70 units of senior housing. They're scheduled now scheduled to open in January. They were supposed to open uh, in the fall, but we all got shut down, as you know, in March. We were shut down as well for a couple of months. And so uh, I think we're kind of back to, you know, construction normal at the moment and um, haven't skipped a beat in terms of our leasing. There's a lot of demand, uh, rental demand for people to live at Cambrian Rise. That's a good thing. And so at the end of, uh, I would say at the end of, of this year, we'll, we will have built and opened about, including Cathedral Square, which is gonna be right after the first of the year. We'll, we'll have, we will have constructed about 300 units, uh, all of them rentals, uh, save one unit. Uh, they're, all, they're all rentals. A year later, we will open another 125 units of, uh, of rentals. Uh, condos, condominiums are a little more challenging because the financial markets are a little jittery right now in terms of financing for sale product, although we think we have significant pent up demand. Um, but it's a challenge getting the buildings built, but we uh, expect to start uh, building for sale product either late this year or next spring. Um, and we recently went to the city council and were approved to up our density limit from 770 to 950 units. It was a cap in our development agreement. It, there's no underlying uh, cap in the zoning district. So we don't know if we'll actually get to a full 950, but I, I, I think we'll get close if not there. Um, when we're all done, if we get to 950, about 
600 of them will be rentals, including CHT and, and Cathedral Square, and 350 of them will be for sale. 25% um, of everything, of course, for rent and for sale are inclusionary uh, per the underlying requirements in the city ordinance. Um, Eric, people I'm ask go me mostly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's show a screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought you were gonna just gonna run me over with this. In any way that which would be okay. You gonna take? Uh, a year ago, what I told. You, We'd be Eric, you need to shut your video off. The, uh, uh, Eric, your Mark video is like uh, it might and be good to turn off the video and get in. Oh, can you see the screen? Yeah, I see the um. Picture of the whole development uh, with each yeah. building from the top. Oh, I got to turn my video off. Is that what you want me to do? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, maybe that will help you from freezing as much as you are. Or oh. Find more bandwidth. All right. Hold on. I know you just want to get rid of me. I get it. <laughs> oh, that works. How's that? Can you still hear I'm me? Good. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So I think. Most of you or all of you have seen this plan before. Um, Liberty House is like right in the middle, fronting on North Avenue. And the Rise, which is the building we built, uh, just opened um, last week to the left of the plan that you're looking at is 90 apartments. To the left of that across Cambrian Way is senior housing, Juniper, they call it Juniper House. And then uh, going up the screen to the west is Laurentide Apartments by Champlain Housing Trust. And then if you cross over um, Cambrian Way again uh, to what we call uh, Sunset House, that's the 125 apartments that we will start later this year, hopefully in October. Uh, and then we have a boardwalk going left, going right again. In that boardwalk, yeah, you get beautiful views of the lake, which will remain um, throughout the development. Um, and then to the right of that, uh, up against uh, close to, closer to the cemetery, is are more condominiums and apartments. Then when you move west on the site, there's um, condominiums um, uh, on. Well, I don't know, Jess, there's condominiums. Jess, can you get on building I? There are point to building I. That would be uh, uh, what we call workforce housing, sort of middle price range condos. And then south of that is, is 80 apartments. Um, and then the three other buildings that are closest to the lake are all for sale condominiums. Um, the one on the southwest corner, far the left corner of this plan, uh, is the first one we'll build. Hopefully, we'll start either this fall or next spring. The other two, uh, the jury's out as to exactly when we'll start them. They're at least two or three years out. And then, of course, west of that is the public park, the 12 acres we sold to the city, and it shows the bike path connection. So I'm. You know, it's kind of a moving target. Um, it's hard to nail down precisely the schedule. Um, it was helpful to get the support of the city council to bump the number of residential units. This is what it'll look like on my, hopefully on my 80th birthday, which is uh, not as far away as I wish it was. Um, and I don't know what the next screen is. Oh, so another thing we're doing is that uh, part of our plan, actually we're working in uh, closely with uh, DPW, uh, we're going to widen North Avenue on the west side. We're going to enhance the a bus stop. We're also putting in 
the nicest, although not the largest, uh, climate-controlled bus stop in the city of Burlington. The city has the largest one. We think we'll have the nicest one. Right on the corner of that building, right on the corner of Cambrian Way and North Avenue. Uh, it's about 450 square foot climate controlled uh, with real-time monitoring uh, in bus stop. That'll happen, we think, next year. And we'll add some street parking. And the reason we want to do that in in particular is that we want to turn this section of North Avenue from an arterial road into a, a neighborhood street with uh, street parking which will you know obviously help the, the neighborhood but it'll also calm traffic and make it uh, feel uh, more like a neighborhood uh, not only Camry and Rise but the, the dozen or so homes that are on the east side of, of North Avenue. Um, and next screen maybe Jess what's the next one? The next one is a blow up of probably that. Yeah, that's a front and center look at Green Mountain Transit's uh, bus stop. Um, although I'm tempted to put a kitchen and a bath in there and rent it out as an apartment because it's a pretty nice space, but we'll probably keep it as a bus stop. Um, and on the commercial uh, first floor, we hope to have neighborhood commercial uses. We're pretty close to making a deal with a cafe. And we want to have other neighborhood uses that would support the, uh, the lifestyle and enhance the lifestyle of the people that live there. Then the next slide is the boardwalk that I mentioned, which is due west when Jess gets there. Can you show the next one, Jess? I'm on the boardwalk now. Is that Oh, I can't see. I can't see. The, oh, there it is. Okay. So this is due west of Liberty House. Um, right on grade with North Avenue, but you can see it has pretty dramatic views of Lake Champlain. And we said we wouldn't build any buildings uh, above that North Avenue grade from North from the orphanage to the lake, um, basically in, in honor of the um, legacy of the orphanage. So, and then there's buildings down the north side, and buildings down the west side, down the south side. Um, that's kind of a really short story. I'm happy to answer. There's another view of it with Burlington Harbor in the, in the far ground. Uh, we're pretty excited about the neighborhood we, we're uh, in, able to create and hope you are too. And you open for questions? Anybody have any questions? <clears throat> nope. You you want me no. to unmute now? Yeah, oh, you don't want to look at me anymore? I see one from uh, Jonathan Weber. Hey, Eric, it's, uh, it's looking awesome. Do you, do you have a timeline for construction of the connection to the bike path? The bike path, uh, if all goes well, we Eric, we heard you up until you said if all goes well. Are you still there, Eric? Hey, he so may have to go. Path by the end of next year, next summer. You want me? To I heard next summer. Yeah, unmuting. And uh, what, what do you mean to get rid of my turn video off your again? Video again. Oh my God! So you don't want to look at me? I get it. <laughs> no offense. Fine. How's that? Good, loud and clear. Okay. All right, fire away. Anybody want to buy a condo? Having a sale? Mm. I'll ask other uh, steers if they see hands. I don't. I don't see. No. I'm looking down and I don't see any. Well, if you want to buy a condo, call Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good though, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, looks great. Well, we're, we, we're, uh, a, it's a Jeff, heavy there's lift. There's a hand up. Sorry? I was saying to Jeff Clark, there's a hand up. Uh, Kate has her hand up. We've got two people with hands up. And okay. Ollie have their hands up. Eric, you want to unmute you them? Unmute, um, what should we unmute? Unmute, unmute Kate? Yep. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go yep. ahead, Kate. Oh, okay. I just had a question um, in the landscaping that you have planned around the boardwalk and all the units, is it going to include native plants and pollinator plants as much as possible? What's the plan for that? Well, uh, um, 
Yes, I think the simple answer is yes. Um, we had made a commitment to do a lot of, um, you know, native plants. It's a little above my pay grade to know exactly what those are, but I think the simple answer is, is uh, uh, yes, we we have that mandate. Good. I hope so. Thanks. Thank you. Who are the other questions? Uh, Ali has his hand up. Bob has his hand. Bob Hooper has his hand up. Pick one of them. Ali. Ali. Un Hi, thank you. Thank you for being here. I mean, I think I needed to, uh, it would be good to shed some light around um, the North Avenue extension. Are you saying that the North Avenue will be losing uh, bike lanes because you will be adding some parking on North Avenue? Is that what I heard? Yes. Um, so uh, we followed uh, DPW's lead in terms of the design because you you know there is the uh, North Avenue corridor study and this is consistent with that. So there are protected lanes, um, and we, you know we agreed to pay for it, but. Uh, it's really um, the, the final that we spent months with DPW working out what they wanted for a design. Uh, we were interested in having parking for the benefit of the neighborhood and, and to make it a neighborhood street. But as far as the bike lanes and the bus stop and, and, and all that sort of stuff, we deferred to, to DPW as to what the design wants to be. Okay. But now the question is why then that, that altered design was not part of your um, proposal when you came to this Burlington City Council? It, 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 it was not even mentioned at all. Well, because it's not part, Ali, it's not part of our permit. It, it's, a, it's, it's a public improvement that we agreed to, to fund, uh, but it's, a, it's really a DPW initiative. It, we don't have to get permits for it ourselves. The only thing that, the, that I think that the only role that city council would play in that is that you'd have to be willing to accept a deed for additional land that we that we and um, and Cathedral Square would have to grant the city to widen the right of way on the west side. So we're going to widen North Avenue, which means the city right of way is going to widen. But apart from that, it's not my responsibility to permit it. I don't know what the permit process is for DPW, but it's it's really a DPW driven design. Okay. And we'll follow up with uh, uh, Chaplain Spencer then. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. So following up, uh, what is your construction schedule for the uh, appreciating the lake view that still exists? When are you going to put the uh, two north buildings up? When are you going to start that construction? Uh, the, the, north the north buildings that are closest to North Avenue? Correct. Uh, the two buildings uh, that, that are on the same grade as uh, Liberty House on yes. um, uh, either late this year uh, in 2020 or spring of 21. That's our target start date for those buildings. And as you can imagine, a lot of this just depends on how uh, the world turns over the next few months. Matt Hurlburt, Eric, can you unmute Matt Hurlburt? Yes, I can. And I know Nancy's also waiting patiently. I'll be just real quick, not really even a question, just a comment. I wanted to thank you, Eric, for doing such a great job so far. I think it's a great addition to the city. You're adding to the tax base um, and you're creating lots of needed housing units. So thanks to keep up the good work. Well, I, I appreciate it. I was, as you know, I was born and raised in Burlington, so I got my heart and soul in this project. Okay, we've got time for one more question. You're up, Nancy. Hi. Um, so the, the buildings so far, Eric, are beautiful. It, it can tell, I can tell that you're really putting your heart and soul in, into it. It looks nice. Um, but my question is, um, sort of along the same lines as Ali's. I thought there wasn't supposed to be parking on North Avenue. The, the, we voted on that to remove parking on North Avenue. 
I'm not sure how you're going to get that back. Well, in, in our particular, along our frontage, there never was uh, parking on North Avenue. So if you voted to remove parking, it wasn't in that particular area. Um, but we, we do want to widen North Avenue so that we can add parking that's never been there. And, and but, for, two uh, reasons, for two reasons, one, to benefit the, the community that we're creating in the homes across the street, and also to calm traffic and make it more of a, of a neighborhood. Right, but we had to remove our parking in order to remove our parking in order to calm traffic. So I'm just a little confused by that. Um, um, I don't know. Is, it, is that in a different section of North Avenue? I'm not familiar with. You know. I, I think that's just more of Chapin's um, smoke and mirrors or whatever. Yeah. But well, I think they're beautiful buildings. So good job. Well, I, I appreciate that. It's, it's a pretty, I think it's pretty commonly in, uh, accepted that traffic, uh, that parking on the street does calm traffic. I don't know what, where specifically, Nancy, you're referring to, but. Okay, I, the time right, people well, are saying the time is up. Thank you, Eric, for your presentation. Okay. Um, I appreciate it. Jessica as well. Anytime. The visuals work great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. We'll move yeah. on um, to the Burlington Police Commission report in community input. Um, we have uh, Shireen Hart and um, we have Jabalini Gamash. And I'm sorry if I, and um, we hope to have a discussion um, tonight. I know um, we'd worked with Carol Lodi a little bit to put to this together and we wanted to discuss racial justice in the police department, Burlington Police Department and create a path forward. I'll turn it over to Shireen. Okay. Eric and- um, I am looking for her on the screen. I've Found right just below Franklin Sarah Carpenter, right near the bottom. It's the trouble is there's three screens here. Oh, wait. No, this Jabulani I've already opened up. Yep. I'll, I'll open her. I see her. Okay. <laughs> Bob, Bob Hooper. Uh, okay. I, I presume I'm okay? Yes, you're yeah. on. Yep. Okay. So, um, Jabu and I spoke earlier today and I, what we proposed is that I would just give a nuts and bolts background of the commission, but it might be that you are, since you're all so active that this is way too basic in terms of how the commission is comprised. So I don't know if that's helpful at all to start with that, or if you want us just to get into policy. I think it's good. Okay. Good background. So forgive me, I'm hoping I won't take long and some of it really is going to be pedantic for some of you, so I apologize, but I started with the most basic. So who are the commissioners? Uh, we went from five to seven a couple of years ago, so we're, we're a commission of seven. And if any of the city councilors hear me misspeak, please uh, wave your hands and get unmuted to correct me. There, I won't be offended. Um, the commission members are appointed by the mayor and city council, and we're not selected based on our wards per se. So I know a lot of folks assume that um, I represent you, and I have no problem. I welcome being contacted, but there is an equal representation. For example, right now there are three people out of the seven in the new North End, two and four and one and seven, which is me. There's someone in Ward 1, someone in Ward 3, and someone in Ward 5, just to give you a sense. We serve three-year terms. It runs from July 1st to June 30th. Our former chair, so Jabalani Gamash, is our new chair, brand new. Uh, we're very happy to have him in that role. Michelle Ash, who's from Ward 4, just finished the three-year term and was our chair and decided to pursue other um, important uh, activities in terms of community involvement. And then we have Neri Miles, who is from four. Her term is ending, and I'm assuming that she's seeking reappointment. Um, to be a member of the police commission, you have to be a legal voter in the city of Burlington. And um, I believe that no more than two thirds of the members of the commission can be from the same political party. 
And so the applications for the two open seats, and when I say two open seats, Neri is reapplying, but it's not a given that you get reappointed as we know from last year. Um, and so the, there's a selection committee made up of the city council and the mayor's office. And I believe it's Max Tracy, Zariah Hightower, Chip Mason and Jordan um, Riddell from the mayor's office who make recommendations to the city council. And then I believe on the 29th, the city council is supposed to um, approve that those recommendations or not. Doesn't always happen that way. So in terms of um, what the Board of Police Commissioners does, um, we were created by city charter. We meet once a month. Uh, obviously now we're meeting by Zoom. Um, and if there's an emergency matter, like there was earlier this month to work on the use of force policy, we will meet at other times. We also, I, I caution people if they want to attend our meetings to check the schedule because sometimes we move it around if the police chief is traveling or the deputy chiefs, if we don't have availability, we will move the date. So I just encourage you if you wanna participate to check that. Um, so I think what's really important to understand, and I know it's something that we as a commission really struggle with and it really goes to the core of things is that um, we're, our authority is strictly advisory with two exceptions. Um, we exercise some authority with regard to if an officer has a grievance and they want to appeal it, they would appeal it to the police commission. I'm in my fourth year on the commission and I haven't seen and I haven't had an appeal from an officer come up to the commission. And then the only other time where we have authority is to review and approve um, department directives. So for example, last week we approved the amended directive on um, use of force. J Jabu, please interrupt me if I'm just, if you, if you, you want to add anything. Not a problem, um, doing and, great. And so in terms of what advisory means, um, if for example, there is a um, police action, a disciplinary action, the chief, there will be an investigation, there might be an outside investigator, internal investigation, they will then bring the commission in, in an executive session to explain, um, we review the case, and then they might say, this is what we're proposing. So we give feedback. That's the extent of it. The chief could uh, accept what we've said for feedback or just say, thanks, but I'm, you know, I believe this way. We are currently working on that policy um, that has to do with our review of complaints. And so I, our expectation is next month, we will be making some tweaks to it. And, and I, I think making some very good improvements to it, frankly. Um, and so lastly, as you all know about, as you probably know about a year ago, city council established a special committee to review committee, community pol policing practices. Jabu was on it, Perry was on it. I'm not sure if anyone else on the screen was on that committee. Um, but anyway, I just wanna briefly tell you, cause I think um, what, the, what the bullet points were for moving forward from that task force. And Jabu, I invite you to correct me since you were much more intimately involved with it. So forgive me, but there are, there are about eight points here. But these were their suggestions. Um, an articulated policy governing when body camera footage can and should be released to the police. It's a complex issue when you've got an ongoing criminal case or investigation. So we need a policy on that so that there's consistency. Uh, that committee also recommend, recommended that the police department formalize the inclusion on the hiring committee of an employee with training in domestic violence. The committee recommended that um, BPD find ways of increased interactions with and accountability with the community. So the department's interactions and accountability. Um, the committee wants the department to continue the efforts to look more uh, for more, continue efforts and look for more creative ways to increase the numbers of women and um, individuals from minority communities. And then the committee recommended that, I've only got three more, thank you for your patience. Um, the committee recommended that the department develop a plan to expand social services 
partnerships and capacities, including um, relationship with Howard Center Outreach. Uh, and I know, Jabu, I think you're working on that actively, right? Okay, two more. Um, they want the city to hire consultants skilled in survey techniques to determine how the community feels about BPD and what changes the community would like to see. One could argue that we got a bit of a survey with the community feedback to city council and to the police commission over the course of the last couple of weeks. But we do want to formalize some kind of survey to get more feedback. And then lastly, um, well, yeah, lastly, that BPD increase or improve the amount and the quality of anti-bias training that the officers receive. So that is some background to um, you know, sort of give us some shared understanding as we launch into this discussion. I, Jabu, um, I will defer to you at this point. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, this is actually my first time sitting in on one of these MPA meetings, so I think I just want to kind of take questions from my buddy out there. They have to raise their hand for us to unmute them. There appear to be a few questions from Jeff and from, from Jeff Comstock and from Keeney Christensen. I saw Franklin as well. From K Why don't you just start, uh, Eric, just start with Keenan and go down the list. Okay. Keenan? Hey, it's me again. So uh, my question is, um, so as we're sort of thinking about some of these reform policies, and I'm going to come back to this fabulous book that I mentioned before. Uh, Sorry, uh, you cut out. Yeah. You hit your mute button there. And then you're muted again. There we go. I'm unmuted. Yep. <laughs> um, Sorry, uh, I, you stopped right at, at, the uh, at the holding the book part. So start from there, please. Sorry. So one of the things that the authors talks about in this book is there's sort of four different perspectives. And one of the perspectives that's missing. It's got to be a question. I, I, I'm going to get there. There is a question. Um, one of the perspectives that's missing is the community expectation standard, where an, an officer's force could be entirely lawful, but still violate community expectations. And I'm wondering what sort of policy changes you folks have envisioned around how do you balance the potential constitutionality of an officer's use of force with the, the community expectation that may uh, view that use of force as improper and inappropriate? Okay. Um, I think we kind of touched on that a little bit in the our most recent use of force policy that we just put out. Um, it's, it's, is it perfect? No, but it does exceed the standard of Graham v. Connor, um, which, which is set up, you know, uh, use of which is like uh, what's, what's the term I think it's like set up the legality of what you can use for force so basically what's in there right now uh, before there wasn't really a duty to intervene if you do see an officer use excessive force and right now we have input we have uh, inserted pieces into use force policy that basically makes it so if an officer sees someone using excessive force they have to intervene um, I don't know if that quite answers your question or if Shereen, you want to jump in on further yeah, so that. Yeah, I, so I'll just add to that, and I hope I'm answering your question, Keenan, that um, what we specified in the in the revisions to the use of force policy is that that constantly, um, the case to which Jabu is referring is the floor, and that in the policy, we um, can go above and beyond that with higher expectations. So, but I'm definitely going to look at the book that you're holding up. So can you hold it? Can you say it one more time? Okay. Evaluating police uses of force. Thank you. <laughs> I hope we answered your question. Franklin, um, can you unmute Eric? Hi. Uh, I guess it's really for Jabu since he's the, uh, that's, his, his official nickname, by the way. Um, uh, have you got, I, I'm, I'm going to say this selfishly, but um, it would really be helpful if the police commission could issue a statement or 
have a brief uh, meeting about how they feel about cutting the police, um, both on a monetary level and on officer headcount. Um, because you guys know a lot more about the inner workings of the department that we may not know. Um, mm -hmm. So I would just throw that out there. Um, I think one of the difficult parts that everybody should be aware of, which I know you guys are, is that it's for only supposed to be a question, not well, that's not a, a not a statement time. Okay. Well, it is, I guess my question was, will you guys consider either making a statement? So much like the school board is issuing a vote or a statement on the SROs. It would be helpful to know where you guys stand under under for the proposals about cutting the, the budget financially or the officer headcount. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to give you my personal opinions on that, and, but um, I I'd be more than happy to um, write up a statement and or at least you know yeah come coming up the commission with come up with a statement and then put one out there. But I guess if you want my personal opinions uh, on it. Um, Great. Now, granted, my vantage point of policing in Burlington is very much centered from like bartending downtown. Um, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, five to two thirty in the morning. So that's that's kind of like my bread and butter when it comes to policing in Burlington. And I do see a lot of uh, room for improvement for where we can absolutely shift um, the budget to more social services to deal with. You know, like uh, you know, transient homeless problems in the downtown area and people who are suffering from mental health crises. So I, I am in favor of uh, the cuts that they're asking. Do I honestly believe that they can be implemented overnight? I do not think so. Um, but if I, I mean, we have to, you know, consult with Howard Center and the resources we have around town here and talk to them and see how, what's the best path forward uh, and what's that look like because it's going to involve them. And so we need to bring them into the conversation, I think right now. And I feel like not, no one's really asked of uh, their thoughts on moving forward. So that's where I'm tr trying to kind of figure that out and how do we go forward from there? Yep. All right. Uh, Thank you very much. I, yep. Sorry. I appreciate that. That's very helpful actually. All right. Thank you. I don't have anything else. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Eric, can you unmute Jeff Comstock? Thanks. Jeff, yeah. you're up. Uh, <clears throat> Giovanni, the, when you asked for uh, general questions, there was a fair amount of silence there. And um, my thought was uh, being sort of unfamiliar with this. Uh, What's your question, Eric? Uh, Jeff? Uh, Linda, take a break, OK? I'm getting there. Okay. So, Jubani, you know, you're- Sorry, at, sorry, Jabulani. Pardon? Sorry, Jabulani. Jabulani, okay. So you were asking, so you were asking for comments and not really knowing where to start. Um, where are some of the general areas of uh, issues under consideration um, that the commission is dealing with that you would actually be looking for input? Um, er, aside from, some of the, the crisis issues that have arisen recently. What are your uh, broad areas of concern? Um, I, I feel that um, all of us kind of bring our own kind of unique thing to the table. And like, like I said, what, I, like what I'm working on is, is like, you know, how to improve, I guess, downtown policing. Um, with that said, um, other people have a more kind of like holistic whole city approach to like how we can do these things. But I feel like my expertise and my, my most intimate knowledge of the police department is how it works downtown. So uh, I guess to answer your question um, for like broad things, I'm, I'm not, uh, I guess I haven't really focused much on like broad, broad things, but I am looking like, like as, as I stated before, I'm looking to see how we can I guess kind of mayor, uh, not supposed to marry, but you know, involve um, the street hours team a bit more, or, or maybe expand their budget so they have more more people on the streets to, uh, to be able to um, handle some of these things. Because from my from my experiences bartending downtown, majority of the calls that I see the uh, the officers respond to are you know people hanging out in City Hall Park, drinking in City Hall Park, and things like that. And I know from you know just talking to some of them that it's a frustrating thing for them to deal with because they're, they don't, they don't have the tools to really help fix the problem. It's kind of like ticket and move. And um, that's not solving the problem. Thank you. 
Eric, can you unmute Bob Hooper? So I just unmuted myself, I guess. Um, good evening. Um, so this has to be in a form of a question, so it'll sound weird, but uh, do you know, uh, I would like to sit down with you because we're dealing with all this stuff on the state level and it's mm -hmm. gonna filter down so that we can sort of all be on the same page in what we're shooting for. I mean, even the use of force and the hiring and collection of data and all that stuff is gonna filter down to cities. So if you got time, you wanna sit down uh, virtually absolutely. or otherwise, I'd be more than happy to do so. Absolutely. Um, I, I can send you, I, I'll, I, can, I can forward you my email address or yeah, that's not a problem at all. I'd love to sit down and talk. Okay, cool. Thanks. Very welcome. Any others? Any other questions? Leanne Schulman and Ali Dieng. Do you have any preferences? Oh, no. First one you called out. Ali. <clears throat> Um, thank you. And uh, Linda, just so you know, I'll make a small comment and then ask my question. Uh, just so that to be clear. So, uh, Mr. Gamash, thank you so much for being here. And it's just been amazing reading about you lately. Thank you. That's my um, thank and you. I think this question is specifically for Sharon Hart, who I love and respect also. But I just wanted to um, make sure that everyone here understand that part of the demands is to fire the three officers, Balavans, Collie Campbell. I always forget the other guy. Uh, but do you think, let me ask it differently. I wanted to know the elements in which you use to determine the level of discipline those officers, at least the two officers that were involved in um, use of force with uh, youth of color in downtown. But I wanted to know the element in which you used to determine the discipline uh, for those two officers. Yeah, I so, just... so Councillor Jen, we can't talk about specific employment matters, but I can tell you that cases that we weighed in on prior to uh, a week ago, when we made significant changes to the use of force policy, we're under a, quite a different policy. Um, and while this policy is far from perfect, that policy was um, very limiting. So we were using a directive, Directive 5.0. Um, that's I can't get into the specifics of the cases, nor you know, in the same way that you couldn't on the city council, other than in. Um, executive session, but I can just say that um, a review of a case that we reviewed to go a year ago, a review currently would be a very different look based on the policies and um, what was available to us. I hope that that helps. Yeah, um, so now the follow-up question to that is... Um, wait wait think, a minute, we only usually let you do one question because we still have another person who, get, who was waiting, Ali, can you wait I'll, and I'll, see? I'll leave it to that, thank you. Yeah, sorry, but we're trying to make sure everybody gets a chance. There's, there's one more person. Okay, I'm unmuting Leanne now. Hi, this is Leanne Shulman. Um, my question is just related mostly to what uh, resources are out there for members of the community who want to learn more without perhaps uh, reading the sort of legalese, I was just wondering if there are resources that you could point us to to help us better understand what the current standards are and also what the current relationship is between the Howard Center and the police department. Just sort of any suggestions would be appreciated. Honestly, I don't know of any resources um, that are currently out there or where they would be look, uh, located at. Um, I'm happy to um, I'll, I'll have to look into that and get back to you. But um, as of right now, I, I, did, I actually don't know where you would find those. Online. Yeah, so one thing I would recommend, uh, and maybe um, Councillor Freeman and Chair Gamash will disagree with me, but I think for a, um, some, for a quick read, seven pages, 
I would at least read the report by the special committee to review community policing practices that um, the that the task force they committee they were on presented to city council and that those were the items I articulate I articulated before from that document. So if you're looking particular to Burlington, I'm not sure if you were Leanne, but if that if you're looking particular to Burlington, I would. You can also email both of us or one of us and you know we can get you more. But if it, if it's Burlington you're wanting background on, that's where I would start because um, I think the committee set out as well as one could uh, the powers or lack thereof of the commission. Okay. Any other questions out there? We have um, about three more minutes. So if you want to go back, if Ali has another question. Um, Anyone else? Um, Martine Gulick, could you unmute you, uh, Eric? I can do it here. Hi, um, thank you. I was wondering if Jabulani and Shireen would be um, willing to uh, share their opinions on school resource officers. Yeah, um, I, I'm in agreement with uh, RJA's demands to remove uh, the SROs from 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 other uh, schools. Um, in my honest opinion, like I I had a great relationship with my SRO back uh, back in my day, but uh, you know, if I feel the community has spoken pretty well about this. Um, I do know Henry Sparks, uh, who's the, I forget his exact, exact title at uh, BHS, but he was there when I was there as well, too. I know he is in favor of having them in there, but he also opened up a dialogue to, for, he wants input from, um, you know, like parents um, of uh, students that go there. So me personally, I, I am in favor for removing them, um, but I'll also listen to the people in this one, too. If there's an overwhelming uh, demand for them to keep them in there, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stand in the way of that. Yeah, and that's exactly how I feel. The same way, um, you know, I just had our youngest child just graduated from Burlington High School, and I know the two officers who have been there um, have had great rapport with a lot of people. But I, you know, I also am aware that there are a lot of um, students for whom it didn't work and it, it made them very uncomfortable and so um, I, I agree with Jabu. Any other questions? Ellie, still have your question? Very good, all right. Well, I thank you both for um, presenting and um, giving us your thoughts and um, taking in our feedback as well. Um, appreciate your time. Shireen, spend some time with your dad. And, uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks for much. Awesome, and thanks for having me. And honestly, if anybody wants to get in contact with me, any more questions, comments, whatever, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm an underemployed bartender currently in this pandemic, so I have a lot of free time on my hands. So please uh, get in touch. All right, thank you thanks again. Thanks for having us. Take care. Next, we have um, folks from Local Motion, John Weber, and who else is um, presenting? I think Chapin, you're on as well. Is it Jason? Yeah. So there was a bit of a mix up with the agenda, but actually DPW is going to be presenting. I think Elizabeth uh, Goringer is going to handle it. Okay. Eric, I could think... you unmute Elizabeth Goringer? Thank you. Oh, I will. Okay, hi, thanks. Um, yes, Elizabeth Goringer with Department of Public Works. Um, I think also the plan for this item was to have the any available city councilors kick off kind of the introduction to where this item came from and then I'll take the logistical 
side of things after they introduce it. Anyone in particular? Ali, are you going to start off? Yes, um, thank you. And I'm glad, Jonathan, you're here. Thank you, Robert, people of DPW, Elizabeth, all of you, Chapin. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and I want to particularly thank Jonathan Weber for definitely working with us um, step by step until here. You know, it has been substantial amount of communication and uh, uh, planning and all of that to get here. Uh, but I think it will be imperative also to just highlight that uh, how proud I am as a city councillor in the new North End, seeing all the improvement on the avenue from bike lanes to crosswalks and now just the love um, that we see now. Mon Avenue has become now more welcoming and very vibrant at the same time. Uh, so it, this proposal in front of us uh, went through an extensive public process already. This is not the first time we're talking about this. Um, there was emails, phone calls, and then we decided to bring the residents of the new North End. And 21 people signed up and participated in a community forum about uh, to listen and hear from the DPW as well as from Jonathan about the proposed uh, bike lane. And um, this proposal was not only for North Avenue alone, but it was for the city in general, Pine Street and main corridors in the city. Um, and many people were really concerned about adding protective bike lane. But I think the presentation we received last time was incredibly informative and many people who were scared and, you know, uh, really rallied behind this proposal because for two things. One, it doesn't cost a lot to the city. It doesn't cost at all any money from the taxpayers of Burlington. And also it is only temporary. We will put it, try it out, and then move away uh, from uh, just uh, try it out and see how, how it's going to happen. And um, I think Councillor Polino, as well as Councillor Carpenter, were all very moved by the detailed presentation and also by the people who showed up to listen, ask questions, express their concerns. And I think that's the way we want to move forward as elected official. We should not let anyone come here to dictate. But when we heard about this proposal, we thought methodically about how do we involve the residents of the new North End. And they showed up. People who were scared about it ended up loving it for the two reasons that I expressed earlier. So maybe Sarah and uh, uh, Paulino may want to add something before we turn it back to DPW and Jonathan Weber. Um, thank you very much. I mean, I agree with Ali's assessment and um, it, it really is important to understand. We heard from a lot of people who really most specifically want to do something right now, this summer, in the good weather, when everyone is so confined, we need to get out, we need to get people um, safely using the avenue, which is the quickest way to downtown. Truly it is, um, as opposed to the bike thing. So this was generated by local motion, as I understand it, as really this period in time we need to get people are out and we need to do it safely we heard and i think chapin is well aware of this next year or maybe over this winter there's a lot of thinking that needs to happen about what we do to north avenue permanently and this is not about that um you know the city's constrained a lot of what you might want to do with north avenue can't happen till we get money to repave it so this is really um for this year and then i hope that going into next year um when dpw is ready we'll have another forum about what do we look look more permanently to and a lot of that relates to paving and drainage and things on the avenue that unfortunately we don't have the money to do right this minute Hello? You're on Franklin. 
Hi, so I don't have much to add on this. I mean, I think that uh, we want to see, use this opportunity where people are driving less to see if this could work. Um, I know that this is a long-term plan for the city that they've been wanting to do. And so we just figured this is a good time to do it for a short while. It'll be a volunteer project and it'll really get people, I think, uh, rallying behind um, this, this new initiative. I think it'll bring more people here and, and also allow the people that do live here um, to commute easier. So I don't have anything else if DPW wants to sort of show their PowerPoint. Elizabeth, uh, we have a very short PowerPoint and really we want to open it up for questions and uh, explain uh, the process uh, moving forward based on uh, um, what the counselors described. Elizabeth. Yep. Um, can I add one more thing before that? And just wanted to add, for example, if there is any issue, this is not DPW or you have to talk to the city councils to establish a community process and to get this process to here. Um, don't attack Chapin, please, but attack me, Franklin, and Polino if needed. Thank you. We are looking at the drainage issues uh, while Elizabeth gets set up. Uh, we have a contract right now for North Avenue to look at the drainage so that we can set grade and uh, include that design in our repaving plans uh, tentatively scheduled for calendar year 2021. A uh, section of North Avenue will be paved this year from the police department up to uh, Cambrian Rise. Chapin, um, I sort of leaped ahead, but um, I'm presuming, and we have discussed that um, in anticipation of a repaving project next season, probably, whenever, mid-summer of 21, will we have an opportunity this winter to sort of have a broader discussion on uh, what, what else we could do at the, kind of at the same time? And I, I understand there's not a lot that you would wanna do until you really look at it in the context of fixing the draining and the paving first. That Happy to meet over the winter, let's okay. do it. Okay, um, sorry, I was muted before, so I couldn't speak. I don't know if you guys are able to see my screen, the PowerPoint. You can. You can? Yes. yes. Okay, temporary okay. great. Affected bike lane. Great. Um, okay, well, thanks counselors for teeing this off. Um, so, yeah, just as a very quick recap, this is a temporary, um, coronavirus COVID-19 response effort that the city is taking. Um, and this is a resident, it was a resident initiated request for additional protection for the existing bike lanes on North Avenue to make biking safer um, as a response tactic to um, COVID-19 because um, you know people are not necessarily comfortable uh, taking public transportation right now. Also the waterfront greenway, which is sort of a an alternative route to get around the city is often very busy. Um, the North Ave provides another option for people uh, getting around the city at this time without having to uh, be in a confined space. Um, and as the counselors referenced, the new North End City Councilors hosted a meeting on June 2nd to discuss options for what this might look like, what would additional protection for the North Ave bike lanes look like and gather resident feedback. So with that uh, resident initiated request, it was brought to DPW and we've evaluated that and determined that it really can be done safely and relatively um, cheaply and uh, it will provide an added safety benefit so um, we are moving forward to coordinate a installation of traffic cones, um, a temporary installation of traffic cones in the existing bike lane buffers. So these 
the cones will go where there's already allocated space for bikes on the road. They're not going to be uh, in places that are taking up any additional space that doesn't already exist. Um, and so that means that there shouldn't, there will be no uh, changes to existing traffic patterns. Um, of course, cones will be spaced appropriately around driveways, intersections, bus stops, because we need people to be able to access these areas, but adjustments can always be made along the way. Again, we're just using traffic cones, so they are uh, pretty easily, easily moved. Um, and if people do see issues with spacing or, uh, yeah, just gauging space around turns, getting in and out of driveways, uh, those issues and concerns can always be reported to see Click Fix at the website shown or the um, DPW customer service number. Um, and we are gonna be working with Locomotion who is uh, recruiting volunteers to maintain and reset the cones on a daily basis or a, a very regular frequent basis. Um, and we've already been working with them on a, on a very similar type of installation this summer, this spring and summer on Pine Street, which has worked, um, has been working really well and, um, has, yeah, has been going well and it's a very similar kind of thing. So this isn't the, the first kind of project like this that we've done in, in response to COVID. Um, and then just in terms of the price, uh, the cones are, we estimate for the number of cones we'll need for this project, it'll be around $7,000. However, um, we already have these cones in our possession because they were purchased for um, a making the making space for restaurant and retail recovery initiative, which is another uh, COVID response initiative. Um, so they're currently not being used right now. So they um, they can be put to good use. Um, some of them are being used. Not all of them are being used. So the extras are going to be able to go towards this project. Um, and that cost came out of the city council designated fund for COVID nineteen response. Um, and after all of this is over, um, these are just traffic cones. They can be reused by our traffic and streets divisions, so they won't um, they won't sit around unused. Um, and then also we will have some uh, several <laughs> many lawn signs uh, that we ordered as informational for people using the the avenue um, to kind of help explain what this is. And those cost six hundred and forty four dollars. Um, just so everyone can know where we're talking about, um, these are the areas where the cones would be, will be getting installed. So uh, Plattsburgh Ave to Shore Road is the top map area, and then Saratoga Ave to Institute Road on the bottom. Again, this doesn't show all of the spacing where they would be, you know, we would be leaving gaps for intersections, driveways, bus stops. Um, this. Uh, this doesn't have that level of detail, so don't worry about that, but um, just wanted to um, show those general areas so people know what we're talking about. Um, and then as we've referenced many times, this is temporary. Uh, we would be looking to get them in as early as this Friday and um, through the end of October, but they would definitely be removed at the end of October. Um, so while these are going to be re removed at the end of October, we, we do welcome and we always take feedback, of course. So uh, my email, my supervisor's email, the customer service phone number are all on the screen. Um, based on how this goes and what we're hearing, um, we are certainly open to continuing the conversation about uh, at some kind of further installation in the future. Um, but right now, like this is uh, this is a temporary installation, and um, there's a website with uh, more information about these types of projects that we're doing right now, as uh, trying to create more space and safer streets in response to the uh, COVID-19, and then just a photo from the Pine Street similar type of project that we have um, up right now. Um, so that's all I have, and I'll stop sharing my screen now. There, you've got five minutes, maybe six minutes, and the meeting app automatically closes. So if anybody has questions, this is the time to do it. Uh, 
I did have a question on when that forum was. Um, I didn't see it. It was June uh, June second, and I'm sure the city councilors could speak more to that as they were the ones hosting it. Elizabeth has a question, Jeff or Eric. Do you want me to? Oh, that oh, was yeah, me sorry, before you, I was you, muted. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was trying to get someone's attention. Well, you, everybody's muted except when we unmute them. Yes, so, I was trying to present. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't see anybody else that. Uh, oh, Carol Odie has a question. And then Matt Harrelbert. Okay, uh, I just unmuted Carol. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is this, when I um, have been going, went door to door in my last two campaigns, what I heard from people was a desire not to hurt bicyclists and, and to have bicyclists know what the rules are that they should be following so that people don't hit them. And so I wonder if you've got any plans to you know, have signs up for bicyclists, have signs up, anything to educate all of us about what the rules are so that bicyclists are safe and cars are, you know, safe. Thank you, Rep. Bode. Uh, I'll just uh, jump in and say that uh, we do need help from our partners in this venture. Um, this is something uh, Public Works is focused largely on infrastructure. Uh, the police play a role in this. Uh, the advocacy organizations uh, play a role in this. Uh, we all need to improve behaviors on roadways and uh, roadway design can help play a part in that. Uh, but to your point, there is education that's needed. Uh, we have put up some wrong way riding signs in the right of way to encourage people to not to ride wrong way in the bike lanes. Uh, but there's more work to do and we understand that. And uh, I don't know if uh, representatives from local motion or police department uh, could add more uh, to that as well. Is that Jonathan Weber, Eric, could you unmute? Um, just a moment here. I found him. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, is a good question. Education is certainly something that uh, local motion takes really seriously and and does a lot of already. We have um, programs that educate folks of all ages on bike safety and the rules of the road. Um, we have a program called Bike Smart that goes out to schools and teaches kids how to ride and how to follow the rules. We also have um, adult workshops, and those have been thrown off a little bit by the uh, coronavirus, but. We're certainly bringing them back online and um, I could see us doing some education specific around these uh, sort of new format protected lanes that are that we've got coming up in the city. Um, so always something that we're looking to do. And um, I would also echo what uh, Director Spencer said that, um, you know, the better the infrastructure, the better the behaviors, the better the, the following of the rules you'll see. Matt Robert had a question. I'll unmute him. Thank you. I just wanted to echo what Carol asked, um, mostly based around rules of the road. As the increase of bike traffic is encouraged and bikes and cars are coexisting in the same spaces, um, I feel just from being on these roads, especially North Avenue, that safety is critical. And I'm not seeing rules followed by bikers. I feel like I am um, a minority on the road. So I can't echo enough Carol's question, what is being done? What are your plans? If you are going to increase bike traffic on the avenue and around the city, what specifically are you doing to educate bikers and drivers, but mostly bikers? I, they don't, in my 
view often respect traffic laws. They don't stop at stop signs. They, they just flagrantly go wherever they can and it's unsafe. They're in blind spots and yes, cones will help keep them on their own side a little bit, but I think there needs to be a lot done safety-wise. I think we're gonna have to wrap up at it. it's 901. Um, I would echo the concerns that we have in the past about North Avenue and the potholes and the, the water that does pool um, and not to put a cone on the other side of that pothole because where will the biker go um, is a real concern that I have and um, we should be mindful of when we're putting these cones on the road because there are so many spots when I'm riding my bike on North Avenue that you have no idea what's under that water. Um, and you have nowhere to go but into traffic. So um, I really hope that you're being mindful of that, fixing potholes before you're putting a cone right next to a pothole. Thank you. With that, um, I think we're gonna have to wrap up, right, Linda, you said the sentence? Yeah, yeah this, it's gonna end and I just sent everyone an email base or a chat basically saying, thanks for participating. I think it went well. We're still learning how to do this. And we'll see you all next month. Thanks, guys. Thank you.